Hello and welcome to episode 6.5 of the Masters of Cinema Marathon, continuing on the discussion for spine number 6 in the collection, uh, René Laloux's La Planète Sauvage, Fantastic Planet or The Savage Planet. If you haven't seen part 6 or episode 6, whatever you want to call it, where I discussed this film uh, in, in, <laughs> in great length and detail without really, I, don't know, I felt like it was such a rambling part, uh, number six, but regardless, uh, I've talked about the film in that video. If you haven't seen us, go check that one out because this will be talking about five short films from Rene Lalu as uh, included in the special features on this release, as well as the special features in general. So we'll get to the special features first and kind of get those out of the way and under the carpet, and then I'll talk about my thoughts on the five short films included on this release, which I was really glad that I watched and, and took the time to sit down and... Um, and kind of take in because uh, you know when I first watched this film I saw that there was five short films from Lalu and I was like oh that's really cool and I just never really bothered to watch them so I'm glad that I'm now forcing myself to watch some of these things for this series and for these videos so um, the first thing I guess I can talk about I mean you don't really need to see all I mean before when I was doing this series in depth I'd show you all the, the covers and kind of go really in depth to everything show you the spine and all that kind of stuff but you don't care um, but there's nice kind of inside artwork to this particularly the um, the, the sequence where they, they're all sat down meditating and they start forming and fusing into each other in the film uh, and the booklet is in particular I think really nice uh, this one is about 40 odd pages long I think let's flick through and see uh, oh, actually yeah about f almost 50 pages long so we have some nice artwork I angle it with the lighting there so you can actually see some of it <laughs> um, images from the film of course and uh, images from the short films as well so we actually get kind of a lot of Lalu's filmography represented in some of the images and imagery uh, also a shot of him making one of the short films there. Really, really nice stuff. And uh, there is a, a lengthy uh, essay by Craig Keller, written in 2006, called The Schizophrenic Cinema of René Lalou. He talks about his entire career, and you know, he, didn't, he didn't make that many films overall as an animation director. But it goes into his life and uh, how he got into animation, and, and lots of really interesting notes and bits and pieces, and as much as I struggle with the booklet uh, and the writings of Craig Keller in uh, Spine Number 4, um, Une Femme Marie, here it's a bit more digestible, a bit more my level, and uh, and again, like I said with the For All Mankind, the text size is a bit larger, so <laughs> there's not like so much text to get through, and I read this in about two, two sittings, and it was kind of really interesting, and I enjoyed kind of getting some context on some of the short films as well. And uh, yeah, and then we get some kind of end notes and images from, again, more of the short films towards the end. And then there is also a short interview with René Lalou himself um, at the time of the film's release in 1973. And I think that's about it. Um, just some more concept art at the end from the, uh, the artist who was instrumental really in uh, most of Lalu's films, which is Roland Topor. So really, really good booklet, and uh, you know, just, just again, really rounds out the, the release in general, I think. So the five short films by René Lalu from 1960 to 1988. So we get quite a, an interesting stretch of time that passes when you watch these five short films. If you decide to watch them in chronological order, in roughly the same sitting, which I did. So the first one we have from 1960 is, and I haven't really learnt the French pronunciations for these films. I mean, I tried to with the main title of the film, La Planète Sauvage, which I believe is you know, it's probably like a 60, 65% decent kind of pronunciation of the title, I think, I hope. But the rest, uh, I'm, I'm not too certain. I mean, we have Les Dents du Singh, which, uh, 1960, uh, and I believe that is The Monkey's Teeth. 
uh, Les Temp Mort uh, from 1964, which I believe is The Dead Times. Uh, and then from 1965, we have Les Escargots, <laughs> The Snails. Uh, and then comment Wang Fo Fut Sov, 1987. And then finally from 1988, La Prisonnière, <laughs> uh, The Captive. So let's talk about these films. The first one, 1960, The Monkey's Teeth. This is a really, really interesting film. Uh, not one I enjoyed very much and not one I think I'd want to revisit um, probably ever, really. But it's very... Um, <sighs> What's the word? Childlike, I suppose. It's very, very rough around the edges. And in fact, was put together by psychiatric inmates, basically. Lalu actually worked at this uh, psychiatric facility for a number of years. And he was instrumental in um, kind of cultivating creativity amongst these kind of uh, patients who were, in, in a move at the time, was, was not that... Uh, common, they were given freedom in this facility. Uh, it was open, no locked doors. They could they wander around the grounds and things, and basically do what they wanted. And there was obviously it's therapy and things like that. People who dealt with heavy depression, and no doubt other uh, mental illnesses. And so Lalu was, I guess, a, a supervisor there. He worked there uh, as an assistant, I suppose. I don't know exactly what his day-to-day -day routine was, but he would get them together in this greenhouse and have them draw uh, and no doubt paint. And eventually the idea came up to do a film, which they first did in an earlier film than is released on the, the Blu-ray, which is Tic Tac, I believe. It's more of a kind of shadow puppet kind of uh, film with silhouettes, which reminds me of the work of uh, Lottie Reiniger way back in the, in the 20s and beyond and uh, the, the Adventures of Prince Ahmed. Uh, there's a, a brief clip of it in the documentary on the Blu-ray. I guess I'm talking about the, the short films before finishing talking about the special features. Okay, I'll talk about the five short films and then round off the special features at the end. I got distracted by the booklet. Okay, we're on the five short films. Number one, The, the Monkey's Teeth. Uh, which opens with actually documentary footage of this facility and showing the pe the patients inside the greenhouse basically making the film and it kind of sets up that this is a film written by by committee these uh, psychiatric uh, patients and so what you're really seeing in this this film once the animated section starts is this free form almost story uh, that that really just abides to the laws of the minds of um, mentally ill people. So we have a man who goes to a dentist and he has his, all his teeth taken out and then he start, then it just all, all descends into madness from there basically and there's this plot where someone is, is stealing teeth from people and, and shipping them off to other people and then this monkey gets involved in this very weird sequence and there's just lots of weird abstract stuff going on. Again, the, the drawings and I believe it's all paper cutouts basically kind of moved across and then shot frame by frame. And it's all very, it's, it's a little bit disconcerting, even like the way that the the perspective is in some of the, the shots of buildings reminds me almost a little bit, just a teeny, teeny bit of um, uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, just a very unsettling, unreal perspective on things sometimes. And, you know, it just, it, it just looks very weird. And if you're sensitive to teeth issues, you might not find it all that pleasant. pleasant. I mean, I, I, I have bad teeth and have gone through some really rough uh, dental um, uh, procedures <laughs> and ongoing issues this year. And so it wasn't that fun to see a guy get all of his teeth pulled out one by one, even though it's very crude animation and drawings. But ultimately, it, it's such an interesting idea uh, behind the scenes of the making of this film, although you could say that he makes the behind the scenes a part of the film when it opens with the documentary footage. So I thought that, uh, you know, the idea of it was very cool. I, I love that he gave those people an outlet and they made their own movie and that was really, really cool. Uh, and I think he said that in the documentary that that's either the most fun he's had or the most rewarding experience he's had on making a film ever was making The Monkey's Teeth. So uh, it clearly meant a lot to him, and I think that uh, making those films with those patients was uh, a really cool thing to do to, to give them, people who wouldn't ordinarily be given that creative outlet, the chance to do that, which is really cool. But ultimately, I didn't enjoy it very much, and again, just more the idea of how it was made was a lot more interesting to me than the actual story, which of course is batshit bonkers. 
Okay, so the second short film, uh, The Dead Times from 1964, uh, it features the beginning of the Lalu uh, Topol collaboration. So between making um, the, the Monkey's Teeth and The Dead Times, Lalu met Roland Topol. They collaborated together, and uh, Lalu says in the documentary on the Blu ray that he, um, he met Topol, and it was this, you know, this kind of very um, fruitful creative collaboration, but one that only lasted about 10 years, and that often these intense kind of uh, artistic collaborations don't last very long. And so it was one of those situations where Lalu had these ideas, I suppose, so did Topol, but Topol had this very distinctive um, style uh, to, with his art, with his drawings. I think he came from kind of doing... Um, Oh, what's, what's the word for that? I completely forgotten. Uh, you know, when uh, in like in newspapers and stuff, they're not cartoons. There's a specific uh, like political kind of. Uh, it's completely. There's a word for it. I'm sure there is. Maybe it's just comic book. I don't know. Strips, cartoons. Ah, it's right there. I'm gonna leave this in. You can have this for free. Uh, it, it's gone. It's completely gone. My brain's just like no nope, wall in front of my my the little door in my brain that knows what that fucking word is it's gone they're completely gone but you know he came from from doing like that that kind of stuff it's a very graphic style feels almost a graphic novel-esque when you see the dead times which is a haunting film that deals with uh, war and death and uh and society uh, and you know it's very very broad in, in some of its ideas and things like that but i i, I really got a lot from it and it has this very this very direct way of drawing you right into the story because it's not even a story it's more of a collage of, of feelings and, and ruminations on, on war and death and just seeing like battlefields and just bits of body parts but not in a gruesome graphic way uh, in more of a cartoony way just these kind of just these body parts very cleanly cut off and uh, in, in abstract at the same time and there's something even more horrifying about that and kind of imagining what that would look like in real life I suppose but I, I thought there was it was really something this kind of black and white um, comic book kind of style but again not like a comic book more like a uh, that, that thing I'm thinking of the kind of political cartoons you know that kind of style um, but Topor's work uh, absolutely influenced because he was a part of the pre-production process on La Planète Sauvage so it's this kind of cross-hatching style as well that uh, it's just really cool to look at and just has his fingerprints all over it it's like his style and it fits so well with what Lalu was was doing with his films, I think. But The Dead Times, I really, really enjoyed it. And, and it was, uh, you know, I'm always interested in films that deal with the topic of death. And, and it kind of, you know, it skates over it very broadly. But it uh, it has a few things to say. And, and w towards the end, it starts talking about how kind of, you know, how, how man works. And how kind of the, 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 kind of the, the monetary system and people who are sick and need to pay money like it gets a bit heavy-handed towards the end but uh, just visually and the music which uh, is done by the same guy who did the music for the planet sauvage is, is really just it ties it all together i thought it was a very very good short film uh, next up from 1965, The Snails, uh, another collaboration between Topor and Lalu, which you can tell from the, the style. And in The Dead Times, in fact, it's it's very, uh, almost just showing you pictures. There's not much motion there. It, it's more, almost like a, a motion comic, if you've seen those, which is you know, a weird comparison. That's kind of what it, it, it feels like. Uh, not that they move in the way of a motion comic, but it's just very static. Whereas in The Snails, we then see Topor's um, his art style brought to life with with more animation, but it's it's very kind of jerky and kind of um, not smooth animation, you know, which uh, Lalu talks about in the documentary uh, about how he wanted to not let the uh, the animation uh, not the animation the, the 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 graphic quality of his films suffer from um, kind of the, the animation that was typically done. So he would do it with literally these painted kind of drawn cutouts, moved, you know, very crudely, but not uh, to sacrifice the quality of the overall image, if that makes any kind of sense whatsoever. Um, but The Snails is a very, very strange film, uh, very abstract, um, recalls more of Fantastic Planet than I think any of the other ones in that sense, both in the way it looks and how abstract its story is. 
we follow a farmer who lives on this weird kind of planet ball in another field uh, with a woman standing on it. Very, very odd. Uh, and he's trying to grow his crops. But his crops won't grow. He's building all these contraptions to kind of hold the leaves up and they just, they fall down. You know, it's just that they won't grow, they won't sprout. Um, and so he just, he just starts crying. And his tears make them grow and sprout. And so he's running around with, with onions and making himself cry. And then obviously his, his tears have run dry. So he gets a machine to kick himself in the head so that he's in so much pain that he cries all over his crops. He goes to sleep. They all sprout. It's beautiful. He's so happy. He goes to sleep. And then the snails come and they eat the crops. And they grow to 50 feet in, in size. And they just terrorize the town. And they, they, they pull hookers out of, out of buildings. And they, they trample people. And they just wreak absolute apocalyptic havoc on this town. Destroy it. And then we go back to the farmer. And he starts to grow some more crops. And we end on a very funny gag. Where he's now trying to grow carrots. And these massive rabbits pop their heads up around the corner. So it's a very strange film. I don't really know what it's trying to say. It, it, it to me, it just seems like an exercise in just weirdness. You know, it looks very good. Uh, it has the same. Um, I, I think it's the same music as well. From in fact, I could probably find out from the booklet if we have the same composer from La Planète Sauvage and also The Dead Times at the beginning of the booklet. It has all the kind of um, the crew listing. So uh, Dead Times, we have uh, original music by Alain Goradua. Not sure if that's how you pronounce it, unfortunately. Uh, yes, so he did the music for The Snails as well. Um, but I don't believe the other two short films... No, that's where it kind of it, it kind of tails off into something completely different. Now, this is the main thing I want to talk about, which is the fourth short film uh, from 1987, How Wang Fo Was Saved. Oh, 15 minutes long. Um, the longest, I think, of, of the five short films. They're all between, like, six... 12, 14, 15 minutes in length each. How Wang Fo Was Saved is a beautiful film. Like, I, I almost feel like it's the best film on this set. I almost feel like it's a better film and a better story, at least, than La Planète Sauvage. We follow uh, a young man, a young Chinese man, who is being taken um, by, I suppose, the, the, the Emperor's men. Uh, they, they, he's been arrested along with his, um, his mentor, who is this great painter, Wang Fo. He met him once in this kind of bar, basically, and this young man was very um, impressed by Wang Fo and how Wang Fo sees the world, and he changed him. He changed the way he sees the world. He took him to, to meet his wife, and he painted his wife, and we kind of get flashbacks to kind of their meeting uh, as they're being carried along in this carriage to the emperor. And when we get to the emperor, uh, Wang Fo and his, his young kind of uh, sidekick almost is brought in front of the emperor, uh, wondering why he's been given this death sentence. Wang Fo, this great painter, has been brought in to kind of uh, answer for his crimes, but he doesn't know what the crime is. Maybe I did a portrait of the emperor, which was unflattering. I don't know. And so the emperor, he's there and he tells Wang Fo why he's brought him there to kill him. Because... The emperor, as a child, grew up surrounded by this painter's great works and, uh, you know, just didn't see much in them because he was a young boy. And so he kind of threw them around and played around with them. And his father was just irate at this and so sentenced him to a life of confinement for 10 years. And so he lived most of his childhood and young adult life in complete confinement from the world. And all he had were Wang Fo's paintings. And he saw these beautiful landscapes and just absolutely lost himself in those images. And for him, for those 10 years, the world that he saw was through the eyes of Wang Fo's paintings, through Wang Fo's eyes himself. And when he came out of that confinement and he saw the real world, he saw a real sunset, it paled in comparison to the paintings. And this disappointed him so much. He traveled the lands trying to find the, the images and the scenarios that Wang Fo had painted and he couldn't find anything that came close to that and realized what a disappointment life was. And so he hates Wang Fo for this and he's going to take his eyes and take his fingers but not before he paints him one last masterpiece. It's it's such a, you know, it feels like an old fairy tale, you know, and it was kind of adapted from another story. And it's this idea 
and, and it's embellished upon, uh, well, I guess not embellished because it kind of happens before we get the Emperor's backstory, but um, the, it, it's kind of, it strengthens this whole idea when earlier in this very short film, uh, we see this sequence where the young man brought Wang Fo to meet his wife, who he, he married young when he was 15, and um, and so Wang Fo paints this young boy's wife, and his wife realizes that her husband sees more in the paintings of her than he sees in her as a person. And so she ends up killing herself over this. And that was the last painting Wang Fo did of his wife was her hanging there. And uh, there's a really horrible line where he's like, you know, Wang Fo loved the, the, the greenness or the paleness of the skin of a dead body or something like that. Uh, and, and so the, the kind of the dialogue is very poetic, but the visuals, like the, the, the beautiful, stunning film, which it really had to be because it's about painting, it's about art. And this idea of art and how it can perceive you and, and how getting lost too much in something that is, is fabricated and not losing sight of what the real thing is and not being disappointed in the real thing because the thing you've created it is so much better than anything else that you can actually experience and how that can be damaging, how that can be detrimental, or how you could use that in a positive way. And it's a really interesting idea that's told very poetically in this, this stunning film. I absolutely loved it. It's a, like a 5 out of 5, 10 out of 10 film for me. I just I, And the ending is very kind of... Uh, I won't say abstract. I keep using that word with Lalu's films, but it's... Uh, you know, it, it's a bit out there, and I really enjoyed that, and I thought that it was a, a fitting, poetic end to a very poetic story, but just the, the visuals, the landscapes, and the, the paintings, and all the little details were just spot on, and I loved the story so much, and it just really makes you think, you know, what's better, the real thing, or, or, or something that you can make that that isn't quite as good, but, you know, you can kind of lose yourself in it a little bit more, but is it a bad thing to lose yourself in things that aren't real more than you should? You know, it just, just make, it makes your mind run, and, and I, I'm sure I could kind of watch this film a few more times and have a, a better review of it, but for me, this is the standout of maybe the entire set. I wish it was in high definition, because it, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the quality of the five short films, they vary. Uh, the last one, which I'll be talking about in just a second, was the worst. Like, it just felt like it was ripped from a VHS. It, it, maybe not, that's probably a bit too, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but, you know, uh, I, I really wish they'd been in high definition, specifically how Wang Fo was saved. Um, but I, I just loved how, like, it just compacted this great story into 15 minutes. I'm really impressed when a short film just captivates me so much, almost as, as much as a feature film. Uh, and I would love to have seen it expanded to a feature film, but maybe that's all you need is that 15 minutes, you know. So I, I love the film so much. And then finally we have from 1988, The Captive, which is a very strange and, I'll say it again, abstract short film about these two orphan boys who travel across a desert, uh, across a sea, to this island which is inhabited by uh, silent uh, inhabitants. Uh, did I say inhabited by silent inhabitants? Uh, <laughs> it's in inhabited by silent uh, people. <laughs> they kind of, I, I guess they're there to, I don't know, exercise uh, some kind of spiritual journey. I don't know. It's very vague. And a whale turns up on the island and then naked women come out of it and then the sea comes in and then they leave and that's it. It's very weird. I, I don't really get anything out of it. It looked really cool. I love the design of the island, but I didn't really get much out of it. I enjoyed it. I might watch it again, but for the visuals alone, it's very short, six minutes and a half, but you know, it just it doesn't have anywhere near the kind of resonance as the previous film that I just talked about, which is a bit, a bit disappointing, but you know, you, you can't, you can't win them all. I believe that was his final film as well. And, you know, it, it's a, it is a very, you know, again, poetic in a way, be, just because of the visuals. Um, but, and there's a great visual, actually. There's this guy who's just sat in, in this kind of, uh, in, in this kind of like a, how do you even describe it? My, my brain isn't giving me the correct descriptors. Um, it's like this alcove, maybe, in, in the side of uh, the, the building on the island. And there's a guy just sat there like this. And there's just water dripping on his head. It's like this kind of, he's imposing himself in this kind of, this self-torture 
uh, and then the snow begins to fall, and we see him, and he's frozen there. You know, just very cool visual um, of this. You know, and you can you can read into things. I think with this film, but ultimately, it's a little disjointed. So uh, a little bit unfortunate there. So that is the the five short films by Rene Lalu. Of course, I preferred and loved uh, how Wang Fo was saved more than any of the other ones. I think I'd go uh, how Wang Fo was saved, uh, then uh, the Dead Times, then uh, the Snails. Probably then the captive and then the monkey's teeth. Again, the monkey's teeth, I love the idea behind it. I love that it happened and it was made in that way. But I, I guess I would prefer to see the captive again because it looks a lot better. Uh, you know, the, the monkey's teeth does look like children made it. You know, so it's, uh, it's just, it's a very strange, unsettling film in that way. Uh, so we have the 56 page uh, booklet, which I just talked about. We also have the alternate USA dub track, which I kind of talked about in the previous um, video, which I didn't really, I didn't watch the whole film that way. Uh, then there is the complete soundtrack for La Planète Sauvage by Alain uh, Garangia, something like that, I suppose. Again, it's, oh my god, just noticed something. That's really interesting. I'll get back to that in a second. Yes, unfortunately, I, 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 I can't pronounce that guy's name, but I, I like his music a lot. Uh, there's a lot of those kind of the, the kind of the, the wah-wahs and the, you know, the very kind of psychedelic 70s sounding stuff. It presents the entire soundtrack. A little bit impractical, though, because you have a menu and you have the soundtrack and it's like track one, track two, track three, track four. And I don't know who would actually put the Blu-ray on and play the soundtrack on the TV, unless you're going around doing stuff, maybe housework, whatever, bit of tidying up, put the soundtrack on, but there's no play all function. And with uh, For All Mankind, the previous um, spy number I talked about, it has those like 20 odd kind of NASA sound archive clips. And so you can click play all and listen to all six minutes of it, which is really handy. And you can sit there, sit back, relax and listen. With the soundtrack, you can't do that. So you would literally have to be sat there just looking at the, the menu and playing, waiting for the song to finish, hit and play again. Very impractical. Don't know why they did that considering the previous release had a play all function on an audio feature in the special features menu. So what I did was I ripped the entire Blu-ray to get the soundtrack, to put it on my computer and listen to it in one go. But I couldn't find it on the Blu-ray files. So I took the DVD because of course this is a dual format release. I ripped the DVD, the DVD had the files of the soundtrack, I then had to convert those to MP3, <laughs> and then I sat there and I listened to the entire soundtrack on my headphones while doing some work on the computer, and I really enjoyed it, so I, I felt like I got something out of the soundtrack being included uh, on, the, uh, on the DVD, at least. And then finally we have Lalu Sauvage from 2003, a 70, a 27 minutes, I'll leave that one for free, a 27 minute documentary about Lalu, his career and his works, and uh, really goes into him making the film and kind of falling out a little bit with, with Topor. Uh, again, I think I mentioned in the previous video, he went into a white rage <laughs> when Topor said, I'm not gonna do actually La Planet Sauvage. Uh, you know, you, you can use my pre-production, but I'm not gonna work on the film because my mum said so. <laughs> so uh, it goes into all the making of that and the kind of the, 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 the Czech kind of animators, I think mostly women made the film actually, which is really interesting. And they, they of course all get credited in the, in, in the credits of the film and stuff, but it's, it's interesting how that was an element of it. And, and, and he talks about that in the documentary about how, you know, how to kind of find the cheapest workers basically to make the film, but also to have workers who were really good at what they were doing. Um, so, and it goes into the trouble production of the film, how many years it took and lots of things like that. But also he talks about just in general, the the short films, uh, some of them at least, not all the ones that are on the Blu-ray, and uh, he talks about his process of making films and how, you know, for him he was never really a success, you know, and it, it was always uh, a struggle to get funding for films. But uh, yeah, it's a really good little documentary, rounds off the whole release, I think this is a fantastic, fantastic release, no pun intended. I wish I got to the special features sooner, loved revisiting the film itself. Um, and, and I kind of posted the um, the previous video, episode six, uh, yesterday, and there's, there's there's been some reactions, people not not liking it as much, you know, which is interesting. But I, I understand that. It's, I don't think it's an easy film to love. One last thing, I just noticed on the back of the Blu-ray, it says today the film can be seen to prefigure much of the work of Hayao Miyazaki at Studio Ghibli. Uh, Princess Mononoke Spirited Away, due to its palpable political and social concerns, cultivated imagination, and memorable animation techniques. So that is where I must have got the initial kind of, oh, this is a bit like Miyazaki. So what I initially thought was it was a kind of, oh, good thinking, Luke, you kind of noticed a, 
it kind of, <laughs> you noticed an influence there. No, I just saw it in the back of the Blu-ray and my brain has kind of appropriated it as my own knowledge or my own thoughts and opinion when it was completely taken from the back of this Blu-ray. So that is where the whole Miyazaki thing came from my head. But we did see that kind of, uh, that little interview there from Miyazaki, which I talked about in the previous video. So regardless, fantastic release, spine number six. And uh, I don't think I have, I do have at hand actually the next one. Uh, to kind of give you a teeny little teaser of what uh, episode 7 will be. It is the 2008 documentary Soul Power. So I'm looking forward to a complete change of pace once again and a film I've not seen before which is really exciting. But I, I give this release kind of top marks really. I, I I've absolutely loved that short film. How Wang Fo was saved. Cannot recommend it highly enough. If you have this and you haven't seen that short film go watch it now. I almost think it is a better film than *The Planet Sauvage, which I love in its own right. Uh, just a very, um, again, talking about *La Planet Sauvage now and these closing thoughts, uh, a very uh, deep film. And you can look at it as a bit heavy-handed and things. Again, people have been saying that to me now that I've posted the first, uh, the last video. But I, I do think that there's, uh, and you always put in to, to films, you, you kind of, uh, you get out of them what you put into them a lot of the times. And so maybe it's just my personal sensibilities that really get something. And one thing I really forgot to mention was that there's very little dialogue in this film. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of dialogue when you hear the, the drug headsets uh, giving the knowledge to the drugs and then eventually to the, to the arms. But the, the actual dialogue between characters into dialogue, just there's not much of it at all, you know. And actually in the booklet, there was talk of how um, there's a lot to be said in the film for how it, how it kind of uh, illustrates and, and animates um, drug use. You know, you see them inhaling the drugs, inhaling this, this, this kind of stuff. I never made that connection. I don't know why it's like, it's all psychedelic. I never made the connection. There's absolutely something to be said there about getting high for sure. Um, but, but I do see it as a bit more spiritual than that and not quite as crude as it's about drugs, drugs, drugs. No, I, I think there is a bit more um, depth to it than just that as a comparison. But I, I love how dialogue is very sparse and often it's just the looks of, of characters at each other that tells the story of that moment and then we move on to the next thing. So it, it really is um, uh, concise with its, its storytelling at times and, and, and kind of uh, just cuts away a lot of that kind of uh, that fat that you might get in other stories and, and animated films. So The Planet Sauvage, fantastic. Uh, no pun intended. Again, I'm repeating myself, so I'll leave it there. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next video. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the fact he throws cans of Carlin into a tree. <laughs> yeah, he's really cool. Yeah, he's really cool. <laughs> but he's not quite as cool as you. <laughs>